Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's quite the honor to travel all the way out here to present to you uh, some ongoing research that we've had in the U.S. on residential fire attack. Uh, I do apologize. There is a lot of U.S.-based information in the presentation. Uh, a lot of things are in gallons, and a lot of things are in Fahrenheit. So I, I do my best, but... Uh, but uh, this is a little insight into U.S. fire attack. We have a long-standing uh, history in the U.S. of uh, tradition in our fire service. When you go to a, a fire department in the U.S., there's a lot of talk about uh, how things have come, why they're, uh, why they're done a certain way, and they follow their tradition. Uh, this particular project kind of looked at analyzing a little bit those traditions and uh, determining some good, some bad, and what we can do to move that forward. So our project objectives, uh, a long list that we put together when we put in the grant, but the idea being that in the U.S., the concept of uh, how applying water to a residential fire affected what's going on inside the fire was a long-standing debate. Uh, some believe that applying water from the outside was a uh, way to instantly uh, mix up the contents of the structure and uh, expose everyone in the structure to what was going on. Uh, some believe that uh, applying water from the inside allowed you to move uh, fire gases away from yourself as you were moving through the structure and potential occupants. And we really looked at, uh, can we analyze some of those beliefs and add some knowledge to them? Because certainly some of them are true, and others could use to a little, a little rework. This is an ongoing three-year project. Uh, I've put the, the project task list up here just so we can kind of talk through uh, what we've done so far. We're all the way through uh, task seven, so we're on the hardest part. We're analyzing the data, and we're trying to come up with uh, what we call tactical considerations for the fire service. In the type of research I do, uh, we're really about increasing knowledge and not as much about developing policies. So uh, our goal is to have an in-depth understanding about what your tactics would do on the fire ground, but not necessarily tell you tactic A is better than tactic B, uh, primarily because they both most likely work in one scenario or another. Uh, choosing the best scenario is where our firefighters are tasked with the most difficult job out there. Uh, they have a matter of seconds to decide that scenario. A lot of it's based on experience and, and, and education, but uh, choosing one scenario over another based on what you're uh, given it can be not only challenging but stressful. And uh, a lot of the time we don't have the, the ability to analyze it afterwards, to take a look at what have we done and did it work or did it not work. As far as I know, every fire in the U.S. has gone out at some point. Uh, so... That means their tactics work. Uh, just putting effective to, effectiveness to that is a challenge. Uh, if the fire went out one second sooner, does that mean it was more effective? And that's a tough question to answer, right? One second sooner could be changing conditions in a spot we don't want it to. One second later could allow us to have uh, different control over, let's say, ventilation, which could have an impact on the fire. So like I said, we're up through task seven. And we're going to get through, uh, I've analyzed most of the data up through uh, most of our uh, 7A, B, C, and D. We have some large-scale experiments that we're still trying to go through, and we'll talk a little bit about those, but we haven't quite got through the data on that. First, I want to say a huge thank you to our uh, technical panel. We actually even have one of our technical panel members sitting in the audience with us today. Uh, when, the US, when we do firefighter research, we find it very important to bring firefighters in. Uh, although, as researchers, we have questions we'd like to answer, uh, they don't necessarily provide the greatest benefit to the fire service. The greatest benefit is provided when we have firefighters having their questions answered, and then they're able to take it out and become ambassadors of the program. What they learn, the knowledge they gain, can then get disseminated throughout our country and others. Uh, there are four uh, members of that panel that are international, and we felt that bringing in a holistic approach to how, how we look at fire attack was very important. Um, I firmly believe that the best fire service probably has a little piece of fire service 
tactics from all of the countries in the world. Um, and if you can understand and adapt all of them, then you are most likely going to be one of the better fire departments in the country, or in the world. So, first thing we looked at is how do nozzles move air? And this is interesting because a as firefighters, you're not really taught a whole lot about what the nozzle's doing. You're taught mostly how to use it, how to uh, put it into operation, how to adjust it, how to turn it on, how to turn it off, how much water is coming out of the end of it. But an understanding of what the nozzle is actually doing for you to the water is kind of lost in that translation. So before we could understand what putting water into structures does, we have to understand how do we apply that water. So we looked at different nozzle types, different nozzle movements, and nozzle placement. So do nozzles move air? That's a question. And I have this video up here. And if I happen to be the firefighter that's sitting at the bottom of these stairs, and I saw that event happen, uh, I would most likely need to change my underwear when I went home. Uh, but I'd have a question in my mind. What caused that? And in the fire service, there has been times where this type of an action or this type of a an experience has been um, seen on the fire ground, and the translation between what caused it and what actually happened is sometimes lost. Based on this view, I would truly say I could move water with a nozzle, right? If somebody told me, at the moment you saw the fireball come down the stairs, somebody put water in a window from the outside, I would put them together pretty instantly, especially if I was the guy inside. But it's really a matter of perspective. If we zoom out and take a look at what was actually going on, there was a crew with a hand line, the nozzle was on a wide fog pattern, and they were trying to direct it into the window. But the, wa the pattern was so wide that almost none of the water made it in the window. But what did make it into the window? the air that the nozzle was moving. And that air was able to push the fire down the stairs. It was able to disrupt the gases and push them down the stairs in this video. So if we look at nozzles and don't include the fact that we're moving air with them, we really don't have a, a holistic view on that fire attack. I could do the same exact thing we see here by just having a pretty stiff wind go in that window. It's the air that's making this movement happen. My name is Robin Zavotek with the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute. We're here at the Delaware County Emergency Services Training Center testing airflow entrainment in nozzles. My name is Jerry Knapp. I'm a training officer in the Rockland County, New York Fire Training Center. Uh, this nozzle testing that UL is doing is, is very important. Uh, we know house fires are controlled by the amount of air that, that's, uh, that's allowed in the house. Uh, we don't know is what our fire streams are doing to that air entrainment. Are they pushing a lot of air in or what are, what are they doing to the fire? Uh, so this uh, measuring the airflow caused by nozzles uh, will be a major part of uh, uh, learning how we control house fires in the future. Our tests today are looking at how the different nozzle patterns, the different types of nozzles, and the different uh, application techniques are going to move either more or less air. Uh, 
I'm Keith Stakes, a research engineer with the Firefighter Safety Research Institute, and I also am a volunteer lieutenant with the Bethesda Chevy Chase Rescue Squad. We are working through a series of different nozzles at different hose line sizes uh, to cover basically what the technical panel uh, sees out in the field. Each department uses a different type of nozzle to flow a different amount of water at a different pressure, and we want to make sure we cover all of those uh, to get the most realistic results as possible. Today we're measuring airflow through the use of bi-directional probes. Our probes are connected to a pressure transducer which takes a pressure signal and changes it into an electrical signal which runs back to our data system. We're using five different probes today at two different ranges to try and determine the total airflow that's moved by the nozzle. My name is Josh Hummel, um, a firefighter with Howard County Fire Rescue in Maryland. As far as the, the experience up here, it's been pretty interesting. These guys are uh, definitely utility players, uh, do uh, a little bit of everything. Uh, some of the data is pretty interesting. We're even finding some, some, some differences between whether it's open environment or when they've been testing moving down the hallway with how much air entrainment's been there. So that's just a little preview of uh, some of the testing that we did for this particular uh, phase of the project. A uh, couple of things that I, I show the video for. Uh, the first one is to kind of give you an idea of the scale of the type of testing that we were doing. Um, we did have a full-size building. We were instrument instrumenting that building. Uh, we were testing as many different nozzle types as we could possibly test from the U.S. Fire Service. Uh, we purchased them all from the manufacturers, uh, looking at different ranges that our technical panel had established to try and uh, kind of bound the problem that we had. Uh, there is probably no less than a couple hundred different type of nozzles in any one area in the U.S. And some people feel str strongly about some types and even more strongly about others. So to really understand... Uh, nozzles and what they're, or how much air they're in training, we had to test all of them. So we ran 64 experiments, and uh, again, from the video, you notice that we started off during the daylight, and we finished while it was dark outside uh, over several days, because this was a challenge in how do, you, how do you accurately test how much air is moved by a nozzle. Uh, when you're talking about measuring airflow, most of the time, uh, you're looking at measuring airflow with a device that can't get wet, is sensitive to temperature, and is sensitive to, sensitive to any mechanical movement. So if you take water coming out of a nozzle and you hit that device with it, it essentially ruins the device along with all of the measurements that you were trying to take. So this became a huge challenge. We looked at different types of measurement techniques that we could use. Uh, things such as uh, hot wire anemometers, but of course if we cooled off the hot wire anemometer with any type of moisture, that would make the signal poor. Uh, we looked at using some sort of velocity matrices that were sampling at different points, and uh, what we realized when using those is there was so much turbulence in our flow that, was a, that didn't quite do it for us. So we came up, and, uh, we came up with a, a concept that uh, allowed us to measure not necessarily the airflow in front of the nozzle, but the air that the nozzle was moving behind us. Because that way we could use the concept of pressure to determine how much air it was moving. So in the upper, upper right here, we have a picture of our structure. This is a two-story uh, concrete base with a uh, wood frame structure above it. And uh, all of this testing was done outside, adding a further complication of wind. So if we took and we instrumented a door on the upper half of the structure, we had two openings, both facing the same direction. That's important because then wind is taken out of the play. Because if the wind is even going directly at this opening, it's going to balance out between the top and the bottom, and it's not going to cause any air movement from the, from the door there. We float our, our nozzle outside the opening, essentially using the concept that as much air as was flowing out this opening here on the bottom was going to flow in through the top. We allowed all of the turbulence to kind of get moved out through this wide space here, and we measured the amount of air that was actually flowing in behind us with the nozzle. 
As we think about how nozzles entrain air, there's a couple of items that are really, really important. And the one that was the hardest to control is actually the length of the water stream. Because the further that water travels, the more chance it has to impact and entrain air into its stream. So if our nozzle, if we were to position our nozzle as far back in the space as possible, and it didn't quite reach out the opening, uh, that nozzle would look poor compared to a nozzle that made it through the opening. So we had to take a lot of time to look at the difference between the distance, uh, the distance between the nozzle and that opening. So we go ahead and we started to flow all our nozzles out that opening. But then we thought to ourselves, well, that's not very representative of the fire service, right? I mean, how often are they flowing a nozzle just out a window? So we started, or out a doorway. So we looked at how can we uh, adjust the structure. We ended up using a set of double doors on top. We would use a single door on top. We looked at using double doors on the bottom. We put a window in that uh, opening. We put a window in the top opening. Just trying to have a good idea about how we're moving air with these nozzles. So after 64 tests, uh, flowing each nozzle in each configuration for a minute and averaging out the data, we came up with a whole bunch of uh, disparative points that we were trying to uh, lump together. And this slide pretty much does the best job of putting together what we currently know about how we're moving air with nozzles. Uh, in the US, there are two main types. There is a smoothbore nozzle, which is a, a cone or a, uh, a solid stream of water. And then there is an automatic nozzle, which can be adjusted from a fog pattern down to a, a straight pattern. When we flowed our uh, smooth nozzle versus our automatic nozzle, both in their straight pattern, we noticed that the, uh, the solid bore was about half as much air it was moving. Uh, but still on a relatively small scale, at 1,000 CFM of air moving through that space. So it wasn't moving a whole lot of air. But as we started to move that nozzle around, we saw that we could move a whole lot more air with that. So we have a couple of patterns that are pretty prevalent in the US Fire Service. And there are, very, uh, there are people that are very adamant about their patterns. If you, uh, if you were taught to flow the nozzle in a pattern that represents a Z, you teach everyone that you know that that is the only way to do it, and if you do it any other way, it'll do something wrong. If you were taught to do it in an O pattern, make sure you're doing it in a clockwise fashion, because if you do it counterclockwise, that'll suck all the air back towards you instead of pushing it out in front of you. And if you don't wet the walls, then the fire can grow back and come back towards you. So some use uh, what they call an inverted U, but it's actually a lowercase n in the English language, just kind of sweeping your nozzle up and across the different spaces. So as we looked at those three, uh, and we did this over and over and over again, 64 different times, we ran into this problem that no matter how we moved the nozzle, they all moved about the same amount of air. So at one point in time, we actually had the guy moving the nozzle try and write his name with the nozzle. So he's using all kinds of different letters, thinking that's got to have some impact on it. And we had about the same. So this, is, uh, this will be pretty interesting for the US Fire Service because there are textbooks that only recognize one of the patterns and don't recognize all of them. Now, if we're talking about airflow, as you can see from the chart, we have just about the same airflow with all three of those patterns that we're using. So regardless of how you're going to move the nozzle, you're still going to move a significant amount of air, somewhere around six to 7,000 CFM. So now we're getting into the portion where uh, we're moving enough air that we are going to impact the fire if the water doesn't make it to the fire. Take that one step further. Let's look at some different, uh, uh, let's compare our air flows that we're talking about with some different air flows that we were able to record. So we did a study looking at positive pressure ventilation, and I presented on that last year, looking at how uh, fans move air in a structure. And we measured how much the fans were capable of moving. And they were capable of moving somewhere around about 8,000 CFM of air when we had the opening sizes equal. When we made the exhaust size twice the opening size, we were able to increase that sum. But when, you had, when we had our nozzle and we moved that pattern to a cone or a fog uh, pattern, we were moving somewhere around 6,000 CFM. When we started to move that fog pattern around, whether it be in an O, a Z, or an N pattern, it was moving about 8,000 CFM of air. So now we're capable, or we have, we've essentially proven that you're capable of moving just as much air with one of those nozzles 
as you are with a large fan at the front door. So now, if we won't put a fan at the front door because it'll make the fire grow larger, then maybe we shouldn't be using that particular nozzle pattern. But if we do put a, a fan there because it will affect how the ventilation works in the structure, maybe if the fan doesn't work, the nozzle on the same pattern can produce the same results. So this kind of summarizes a little bit of what we talked or what we looked into. There are thousands of more data points that we're going to pull out of these, trying to look at the difference between manufacturers, the difference between some uh, styles of how the the nozzles break up the the patterns. But uh, for the most part, the biggest takeaway for us is no matter how you move your nozzle, you're going to move some air, and if you move your nozzle the right way, you can move a whole lot of air. Keith Stakes here with the Firefighter Safety Research Institute. We're here today in Northbrook at UL's headquarters conducting water mapping experiments within structures. We are looking at where water goes within a room from both interior and exterior fire attack. Firefighters across the country apply water into structures very differently using different nozzle techniques, different applications, and different patterns. We were able to study over 80 experiments to try and determine how those different techniques affect how water is distributed inside a room. I'm Adam Barraway. I'm a research engineer in UL's Fire Research and Development Group. This week, we're using UL's actual delivered density apparatus, otherwise known as the ADD apparatus, to measure uh, hose stream flow rates. Typically, this device is used to help sprinkler manufacturers design sprinklers by knowing where the water is sprayed during a sprinkler activation. So this week, we're just using hose streams and measuring the water by collecting it in these funnels which run down into barrels which are connected to pressure transducers which ultimately allow us to calculate out flow rates within a given area. My name is Kelly Hannock. I'm a lieutenant with the Eden Prairie Fire Department in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. It's interesting to see how we're um, repurposing equipment that UL had to gather new data that we haven't had to help us in our understanding of what's happening on the fire ground. Uh, my name is Tony Carroll. I'm with the Washington, D.C. Fire Department. And it's really interesting to see where the water is going. Um, I think it's showing us uh, some of the things that we thought was happening and also showing us some things that, that we didn't think that where water was going to go. And I think we can use the information to come up with some, some findings in our fire attack panel study. Modern fire research has really impacted our department uh, as well as the fire service across the country when it comes to how we do our jobs every day. We found that buzzwords like transitional attack, it's stuff that we've been doing for a long time and there just wasn't a lot of education and science out there to validate it and to explain why we were doing things that we did, why they worked or didn't work. And so in participating in this study and other research that's going on, it's really allowed our department to grow and evolve with the times while maintaining our traditional aggressive stance um, as an urban fire department. So 
So if we first look at how uh, nozzles move air, the next question is, where is the water going? And there's been a lot of research on, uh, especially fundamental research on how uh, the water and fire react together. So what droplet size, how much of it is evaporated, what, to, uh, what is the ability of the water to absorb the heat? But uh, we wanted to take a step back and say, you know, where is the water in the compartment when it comes out of the nozzle? And a lot of the times in the fire service, especially in my time, uh, I can't see where the water is going. There is enough smoke between me and where the water is going that I have no idea what it's hitting once I spray. So uh, we took and used a, an apparatus that was developed at UL to measure sprinkler density delivery. So uh, it has 48 bins that are positioned throughout. Each bin is roughly about half a meter square. And uh, we built a room over top of that. And we applied water in that room 84 different ways to take a look at how is that water, uh, where, what bin does that water end up in? Here's a graphic of the room. We had uh, a window on the side, a hallway off the front. The idea being here, we have three different methods for applying water. We have either a second floor fire where we're applying through the window. We have a uh, first floor fire where we can be up on our platform and apply through the window. Or we can apply water through our hallway on the same level through a door opening inside the structure. So this was really a, a point to look at the difference between interior and exterior streams. But as we took a, a, a harder look at how the results came out, it turned out it was really identifying where water goes regardless of if you're on the inside or the outside of the structure because you want to best use that water. And how to best use that water needs to be able to distribute it properly in the room. These are charts of how, uh, how it turned out for our data here. And we're looking at each one of these bins being one of the bars on the graph. Uh, we are in gallons of water, but uh, you can just kind of get a representation of about how much water is going to each spot. And whether we applied the water from the outside through the window or the inside through the door, if we applied it off the ceiling at a fairly steep angle, by looking at these, you can see just about the same amount of water is going in the same places regardless of where you're applying it from. This was revolutionary to the US Fire Service because uh, this is physics. So if there's an angle and a trajectory, you're going to get the same result regardless uh, as long as that angle and trajectory were the same. So our water was coming in through our window. And one of the challenges that we noticed in the US Fire Service was, how do we get water to the center of this room? That water is moving with such velocity that as it hits the ceiling, it actually sticks to the ceiling. The viscosity of the water causes it to ride along the ceiling and eventually falls off when the momentum drops off. But as it's falling off, it's really hitting the walls, and it's kind of running down the walls, and then it's getting collected in the bins on the outside of the room. But it's not necessarily getting into the middle of the room. So we took a, a look at some uh, different ways to apply, thinking, how can we get more coverage in the room? This instance, we looked at, can we bounce it off the back wall? So is the water moving fast enough that when it hits the back wall, it's going to break up into a pattern and come back? And the answer was no. It still hits about the back side of the room. And uh, because we're flowing in the 180 gallon range, it's just all collecting along the back room. The droplets are too large to travel. So then we decided, let's break that angle up into a fog pattern. Is that going to make any difference if we make a cone pattern? As we made a cone pattern, we actually were able to keep more of the water in the back of the bin because it bounced off less of the wall. So we were able to just fill up the back of the bins. So then we took a look at some innovative ways of doing this. And this is where we really started to ask ourselves the question, one, does it matter if the water doesn't get to the center of the room? But two, if we do need it to get to the center of the room, how do we get it there? And on the left, we actually reduced our pressure in our nozzle. So we have a, a smooth bore or solid nozzle. And we do reduce the pressure coming out of that nozzle to 10 PSI. That's uh, considerably low in the US Fire Service, is about one fifth of what the US Fire Service would typically consider adequate nozzle pressure. But when that bounced off the ceiling, it broke up very nicely. And we ended up with somewhere around about two to three gallons a minute in each one of our bins, which 
that's a pretty good coverage, pretty good distribution. The challenge with that is, is with a hose with only 10 PSI uh, pressure in it, as soon as you move that hose, it kinks, and then no water comes out the end of it. <laughs> Challenges of research. So then we looked at, uh, can we deflect it off the ceiling? That being, can we take and hit uh, the windowsill and create like a sprinkler deflector that's going to allow it to kind of disperse before it hits the ceiling, before it hits the top? And that did a fairly good job of, uh, of filling up some of the middle bins. Didn't, didn't do as well on the outside, but it filled up the middle. In summary, we found that regardless of how you apply the water, because it's moving so fast, there's re it's really difficult to get it into those bins. Now, if you want to take the sledgehammer method, you can actually hit the object that's burning with 180 gallons a minute, and it will both extinguish it and move the object across the room at the same time. Uh, so that's really the challenge here being that uh, as that water is working, it's most important to cool the surfaces. If we can't cool those surfaces, we cannot extinguish the fire. So we need to come up with some ways that we're going to apply water to the middle of that room to make it look, uh, or to make it most effective. Now, we still have some work to do on this. Uh, we really want to look at, at comparing some of this to the known sprinkler uh, densities that are required by some of our standard NFPA codes in the U.S. to try and look at how do those uh, densities compare to how much we're delivering with the hose streams and the effectiveness. We're here in Northbrook, Illinois at UL's large fire lab conducting our full-scale fire experiments for the fire attack study. This project centers around interior and transitional fire attack, looking at victim survivability in residential structure fires. Feeling good? Excited? All right. You're in one of the largest fire labs in the world. So what we have behind me is two 1,600 square foot houses that are meant to simulate the average of what you would have in the United States. And we're studying how firefighters fight fire. What we do is we sensor these buildings to make 250 readings in each one of these buildings to understand what is the actual best way to fight a fire. Measuring temperature, heat flux, gas concentrations, uh, all of the things that could possibly kill occupants and also harm firefighters. We're gonna burn these houses 30 different times looking at different methods to attack the fire to give the fire service the input that they're looking for to be more effective, to rescue more people, save more lives. The first two components of the fire attack study were studying how nozzles and train air, as well as looking at water mapping to see where water is distributed within a structure. Both hose streams and fires themselves move air throughout structures by pressure differentials which create flow. So if we focus in on the host streams themselves, we can determine how our water application is affecting fire behavior during suppression operations and can help dictate which tactic to use in a given scenario. We've got our partners from the University of Illinois here. Uh, they bring some steam measurement to us. For the first time, we're able to do some new measurements to quantify the amount of moisture in the air during fires and after suppression, as well as the effect of moisture on skin burn risk for potentially trapped occupants. The technique that we're using here to uh, quantify the moisture is absorption spectroscopy. Uh, we have a wavelength where water absorbs the laser uh, intensity and creates a valley. Then we can quantify that valley into an extra moisture content in that air. So in the study, we've placed the instrument at several different locations. Um, at several different heights to see if we're in the soot layer or not in the soot layer, what kind of different readings we're getting. We also tried to go at different victim locations because closer to the fire, farther from the fire, is there more water vapor, is there less water vapor? And also for the water applications, we wanted to get an idea of is the water steam expansion just a local phenomenon near the fire or does it spread out to the entire structure? Pigskin has been used to look at contact burns. Uh, extensively in the past as a surrogate for human skin, uh, but this is really the first chance that we've been able to look at thermal burns um, without any contact 
uh, especially in the fire service. Typical pigskin thickness is about three and a half to four and a half millimeters, and that correlates well with the skin on a human's back. So what we do is we take the thickness of the pigskin, and then we put a thermal couple on both the top and bottom of the pigskin, and below that is a piece of rubber with similar thermal properties to human fat, and then beneath that is a water bath that serves as a kind of a heat sink similar to the human body and that water bath is maintained at 98.6 degrees to simulate human body temperature. At those locations we also have a heat flux gauge uh, where we can measure the intensity of the heat reaching that victim. What we're hoping to do is be able to correlate skin temperatures and potential burn damage to those heat flux values and then ultimately um, any other study that's using heat flux gauges we can determine what the burns would be to that victim. Like all of our earlier projects, this project is increasing the knowledge in the fire service, putting data to tactics that have been used over the decades to better understand how each affects victim survivability in a structure. So that's a little preview of the next phase, which was we're looking at full-scale structures. All right, so uh, we construct two full-scale houses in our lab. They had uh, four, um, there were two identical 1,600 square foot houses, and we're looking at uh, measuring all of the temperature, pressure, gas velocity, heat flux, and oxygen concentration. Uh, we had about 240 sensors in each one of the houses, miles of cable, and, and hours of setup. Really looking at how do uh, the difference between interior and exterior fire attack, uh, or what are the differences between interior and exterior fire attack. So here's a, an example of an exterior fire attack. And we have uh, fire coming out of one of our windows here. We have our firefighter applying water to the window. At the same time that he's applying the window, we have a firefighter controlling the ventilation at the front door, waiting for the water application to stop. Once that water has made an impact, the firefighter is going to open the door and head in and do the interior attack. But our question is, what's going on on the inside of this instance? So this is the same video we have here, but now we're going to look at an interior thermal view of that. So we have an infrared camera looking down the hallway. This is the fire room. As we can see, we still got some, some fire coming out. An interesting uh, point in fire dynamics, we noticed that because there's no opening on this side of the structure, we don't have a lot of heat flowing towards the rest of the structure there. So the fire is fairly contained to the bedroom. When that door gets opened, then we start to move some, uh, some gases down that hallway to interact with the bedroom fire. As they interact with the bedroom fire, they start to come back out, and now we're going to start to see those hot gases flow down the hallway. And now we're looking at the difference between applying water with the door open and applying water with the door closed. So as we apply water, we're watching our thermal conditions at the end of the hallway there, and we see the effect that that water had. We noticed early on in this study that unless we got water on the contents, the fire rate grew rather, regrew rather quickly within one to three minutes. So you notice he's putting some water on the contents, and he's going to proceed to the inside to finish suppression. This is the part of the study that we're nowhere near complete with. <laughs> That's just two previews of it. Uh, with 25 experiments and 250 sensors in an experiment, there is so much to look at that we physically cannot do it. So we have to break it out and make it a little more digestive. Uh, we've shared it with our technical panel, and we've probably got about three comments back. Uh, most of them are, wow, look at all this information. Uh, I'm going to need more time to look at this. So we're working on breaking some of that stuff out to try and analyze it a little bit better, uh, trying to put things on the same chart so you can kind of pick some of that out. We're running some analytics on the data to try and uh, uh, have some computer programs pick out the important points for us so we're not looking at large charts of them. And uh, once we get that finished, we're going to meet with our final technical panel to kind of go over the results of the study. And uh, we're looking at this being complete sometime uh, probably like December of next year. We've still got about a full year on our grant to complete that. So I uh, just wanted to kind of give you a preview of that. We saw, you know, uh, we saw some great results in our air entrainment. We saw some great results in our water flow. And now we're going to put that all together in this, uh, this full study here and try and look at uh, how does that fire attack really uh, impact what's going on inside. 
So I had uh, about 45 minutes to talk to you, which is uh, almost no time whatsoever. So I can give you a preview of some of the work that we've done, uh, but going into the specifics takes a lot more time than that. Uh, this is a list of all the, the research that we have. All the stuff in the black has been completed. All the stuff in the red is ongoing. If you like some of this information, you can head to our website, uh, ulfirefightersafety.com. We have all of the reports up there, uh, some free online trainings as well. If you're interested in following us on social media, we have YouTube, Vimeo, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. And uh, just a quick shout out to the team. Uh, I had the opportunity to come over and share with you some of our research over the last couple of days, but this team is really what's putting together all that work. It's certainly not one person, it's not even 10 people. Uh, without the team and our technical panels, we could never put all this work together into to one uh, project and get the information out there. Here's a little quick shot at our online training programs we have if you're interested in some of those. And the big highlight, a uh, huge thank you to IFV. Uh, we have officially translated uh, one of the reports or one of the online trainings into Dutch. So uh, if you would like to for free today, you can head to our website. Uh, it takes about two and a half hours, so don't do it during anyone else's presentation. But <laughs> If you're interested, you can go in there and take, take, those, uh, take those courses. Without that partnership, we would never be able to accomplish that. Uh, we just don't have the resources. And uh, as we've learned in some of our time, the translation of specific terms is very important. Uh, you cannot have a non-firefighter translate firefighter material, or we come out with some results that are quite interesting to read. So uh, special thanks to them on that. And with that, I'm just about on my time, but we'll see if we have uh, any questions. Robin, thank, thank you very much, Robin. We'll see if there are any questions, but one thing uh, ahead. I, I started this morning by uh, stipulate that we have to take care because we put our people in a very dangerous zone. And you showed again that we need really to do some investigation to learn and to study what's all about. It's not about putting water on the fire. It's, it's about science. Thank you very much. Any questions for Robin? Who wants to earn the microphone? No, nobody if, wants to if catch it. If you're scared <laughs> for it, you just can bring one, so that, that wouldn't be the problem. Any questions? I think we all are a little bit flabbergasted with what you said. And <laughs> if there are no questions, you're still here today. Yes. Any, any, any other time is a good time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ramis Avotek. There you are.